throughout the world in the novel, there is a tendency to assume that the actual intellectual life of man began not more than 5,000 years before the beginning of the Christian era. Behind this date, it is assumed that man was slowly emerging from savagery. This is a very interesting point of view, and one that probably will not be entirely clarified for a long time. The story, however, as we now have it and believe it, is not entirely convincing. Man's sudden emergence into an intellectual life is rather too rapid. The measures of his early achievements rather too prodigious. And it is difficult to imagine that the builder of the Pyramid of Cheops simply had an extraordinary idea all by himself and created the finished product without the knowledge and skills which it is now rather obvious were necessary for its accomplishment. We go to the East and in Asia we find evidence of a great learning emerging from behind the dark curtain of history. Where this learning came from we do not really know. But it seems extremely doubtful that human culture, human progress, has existed for such a short period of time as we commonly think. And in my estimations a few moments ago, I was very, very generous in terms of modern thinking. Most moderns will not permit nearly the time span which I have intimated. Yet in India there is no doubt that the philosophical systems have a much larger concept of the universe, a concept that was certainly most thrilling to an open and intelligent mind from the rest, a concept which opened a great many doors to a new appraisal of the entire history of man and his relationship with nature. We have every evidence in ancient Indian writings, traditions, and legends that these people were firmly convinced that human culture goes back an incredible period of time so far as our thinking is concerned. They were also quite convinced that the present pattern of culture or civilization is not the only one that has existed and that somewhere under the ruins of things, perhaps too fragile to leave important uh, records or important uh, developments within rock stratification and so forth, there were great cultures, great civilizations of long ago that vanished away in a dawn of time and for which we have no historical account or record today. The old Hindus certainly believed this. And in the rather contagious atmosphere of their approach to life, it was possible to have a great many interesting ideas spring into their own mind. The East Indian position opened the way to a complete reappraisal of Western thinking, an appraisal based on the proto heritage of man rather than upon the heritage of a single civilization or hemisphere. Let us then assume that in Hindu astronomy we present to the consideration of Western man a concept of magnitudes not available to our way of life except in the last two or three centuries. 
even in the days of Columbus, we did not have any adequate comprehension of the world to which we belong. Yet there is no question that the ancient Hindus did possess a knowledge which was useful and practical relating to these matters. One point I think we have to bear in mind in connection with Eastern philosophy. Though it may appear to be extremely accurate in many ways, it was never especially dogmatic. Both Hinduism and Buddhism frankly admitted that all words used to express ideas must be accepted as symbols rather than as identical with facts. Words were not used to completely expose meaning. They were used to suggest meaning. It was assumed that to go beyond this point was to step outside of a reasonable province of man. Why should we express exact meaning or imply that we do? when we do not possess such meaning? Why should we try to take an absolute stand in a world in which we have only relative knowledge? The ancient person, therefore, was inclined to be rather modest in his pretensions about knowledge. He did not expect the great concepts which he expounded to be accepted literally to be regarded as hard and fast and fast facts somewhere in space. Uh, there were improvisations upon a cosmic theme. The full theme man did not understand, and may not for a long time. And therefore all dogmatism does little more than paralyze progress by locking men's minds in attitudes that are not final and therefore which cannot be defended as final. But in their astronomy, uh, the Hindus took it for granted beyond any question that the entire field of space was not only alive, but was ensouled by consciousness. The creation was an expression of consciousness. That all things as we know them arose in the divine nature. Just as thoughts, ideas, inventions arise in human nature. To these people, therefore, there had to be an infinite consciousness. There had to be something so vast that it extended beyond the galaxy, that the whole pattern of the Milky Way with its millions of suns was only an incident in this consciousness, that it went on and on beyond conceivable time and space, in the that which is timeless and spaceless. It proceeded from that which is final to infinity in all directions, and in every quality, it not only extended in terms of air, but it extended in terms of internal structure, so that the innermost parts of things uh, were as far from our present knowledge as the outermost parts. The immensity within life is reflected in the immensity outside of living organisms. Everything, therefore, was a vast unfoldment of infinite consciousness. This infinite consciousness, by virtue of its own infinity, could conceive a general producing form, anything that arose within its own nature. It, therefore, could produce an incredible diversity of creations, adjusting each to the circumstances of its own nature, adjusting each 
to the great circles of evolutionary process which permeated and sustained the entire pattern. This consciousness also contained within its own nature the mystery of all forms of consciousness conditioned and dependent upon the cosmic mind itself. Therefore, within consciousness was mind, which is subservient to consciousness. Within consciousness of mind is feeling, which is subservient to them. And throughout all creation, life moves into activity, which again is a lesser manifestation of consciousness itself. Thus, we think of one consciousness, one life, one existence, one origin, one means, one end. All enveloped within so intricate and inconceivable a pattern right, that the human mind simply cannot grasp it. So in the old Hindus were satisfied to simply create word pictures to give some idea of what it really could be, might be, must be. But they would not dogmatize. They would not attempt to declare what was in divine consciousness, what it intended, how it intended to manifest itself, or what its ultimate goals might be. These were too great for the human intellect to cope with. In addition, therefore, to the problem of consciousness itself, must be considered the means by which consciousness was able to administer this vastness, a vastness which, as we suggest, is not to be conceived by man. More suns, worlds, globes in space than there are grains of sand upon the earth. And each one of these globes and each one of these grains of sand a living thing. For everything that exists exists because of life and because it partakes in universal life. Therefore, this universal life must not only be infinite in its power, but it, may, it must be able to incline itself to the contemplation of the most minute, the most inconceivably small of all living things. And here we have this brilliant, this magnificent, this incredible structure, which to the ancient Eastern people constituted the anatomy and physiology of the Absolute. From the first of these, of these speculations, therefore, we gain one concept, which was to find its way into Theosophy, and that is the realization of what may be considered an acceptable concept of God. God has infinite life, infinite consciousness, infinite mind. God not as a person, but something that transcends person, yet is capable of producing personalities out of itself on the lower levels of its own manifestation. But this infinite is a being, an essence, a substance, but not a person. Yet it is deficient in no attribute that we can assume a person can possess. Because all persons, no matter how exalted they may be, in our imagination, even up to the throne of deity itself, all persons are but partial manifestations of the infinite. All personality is a conditioned release of energy, which exists completely, perfectly, and inevitably in the unconditioned. This unconditioned may properly be termed Atman. It may be properly considered 
to be life held in common by everything that lives. It may also be regarded as, a, as an essence, being, or substance so infinite that man can never outgrow it, can never so highly evolve any part of his own consciousness that he can transcend the fact of consciousness. No matter how he uses consciousness, he can never come to the point where he can declare this consciousness to be unreal or to be merely an aspect of something still greater. Consciousness per se is that which is shared by all things, great and not great. All things come from it, all things return to it. And in Indian philosophy, consciousness itself is the only immortal, the only eternal, the only reality that is unborn and cannot die. Now, the Hindu says this, perhaps with his fingers crossed. For actually, he does not know whether it could be born or whether it could die. He only knows that in terms of his own comprehension, it is inconceivable. Beyond this, he can only wait until some mysterious power in the process of infinite growth releases the truth into manifestation for him. So we now have a universe in which the most positive and ultimate pole is consciousness. The infinitely negative pole is matter, and there is actually no difference between the two. For matter is only a mode of consciousness. Matter is only one of the infinite thought forms that arise in the infinite consciousness. Matter is not something left out. It is not an adversary. It is not a negation. It is simply a condition. Now, if we could penetrate matter, we would discover that the more deeply we entered into the mystery of matter, the more rapidly we would approach the true fact of consciousness. For consciousness is at the root of matter, even as it is in the absolute extensions of space. This realization of one life was perhaps originally scientific. And uh, the Brahman mind was astonishingly capable of scientific thinking to the degree that science is possible. But it was never obsessed with the idea that mind could master all things. The Brahman was never certain that he could know all, or all that he knew was knowledge. He could only go as far as he could, and then admit that from that point on he was ignorant. And it was that last admission that saved him, because he was never involved in absolute dogmatism the way Western thinkers have become involved. The next point that is of importance in this consideration is the second great hypothesis namely that consciousness in its infinite manifestation reveals an absolute plan. Consciousness, whatever it may be, contains within itself and stamped within the, every fragment of itself a pattern, a pattern of process. The motion of the infinite toward the finite and its final involvement in financeness. And the ultimate motion of consciousness from this involvement back again to its own pure state, processes that we call involution and evolution, borrowing from the thinking of 19th century European minds like Herbert Spencer. These processes are orderly, lawful and inevitable. Therefore, the whole of space 
is permeated not only by consciousness, but by consciousness purposed. It has a reason. It has a cause for its own existence. It has a destiny within itself that must ultimately be revealed. This destiny locked within consciousness itself is the only valid destiny. It has never been true and never will be true that man has the right to create a destiny. He has only the right through the unfolding of consciousness to become aware of destiny. All action, therefore, that is valid, all learning that is valid, must be founded in the awareness of the purposes of consciousness and the message or meaning or substance of knowledge which consciousness contains. Consciousness is therefore identical in itself with law. Law and consciousness are co-eternal and can never be separated from each other in the smallest particular or for the slightest instant of time. Law is actually the way consciousness works, and we have no redress from it at any time, under any condition. We can never ask for it to be varied or violated, because we have no power with which to cope with lawfulness. It is within us just as surely as consciousness is within us. It is conveyed to us by every ray of the sun. It is revealed to us by every alternation of the seasons. Every process in the infinite is infinitely lawful. So we have a, a strange and wonderful condition of eternal awareness, and what it is aware we do not know. If it is aware of itself, the Hindu assumes that it is then introverted in rest. If it becomes aware of the not self, it is then extroverted into the process of creation. And this process of creation and return to the uncreated it represents the great tidal motion in consciousness, the tidal motion of ebbing and flowing, of becoming revealed and becoming hidden again, of moving to, from rest to activity and passing from activity to rest again. So the Hindu now has a universe composed of two equally valid things which are one in essence, consciousness and the method or means by which consciousness operates. This method or means being innate, inevitable, and coeval with that uh, which manifests through it. Thus we suddenly come into the presence of universal law. And universal law, in turn, reminds us of the relationship of man-made law to the infinite. And reminds us that the only valid relationship is that man must obey. And that all human laws must be based upon divine or universal law, or they are not valid. The third value or power that rests within the nature of infinite consciousness itself is volition. Consciousness moves. Consciousness causes to arise within its own unconditioned existence certain conditioned states. Some Indian systems of philosophy assume 
that volition is identical with consciousness is also eternal, and that the processes of arising within consciousness are also eternal. But there is never an instant, never a time when the real manifestation of consciousness is not also operating. Therefore, consciousness is eternally created, causing to arise out of itself innumerable conditioned aspects of itself. In this way, so to say, following the law of the planting and the reaping of grain upon the earth, so that the processes of creation are forever producing a harvest and a multiplication of the seed, so that the harvest is enriched tenfold. This volitional power also rests within everything which is by nature a part of this cosmic system. And that means, literally and actually, everything. Consequently, all natures have within themselves the volitional power to grow. And this volitional power also include, includes the generative power to procreate, to reproduce, to perpetuate kind and species. This process of infinite perpetuation uh, being obvious in space as well as in the ordinary affairs of the animal and vegetable kingdoms. Out of all of this, therefore, there comes the essential concept of an eternal symbolic being ever in meditation, seated eternally in the adamantine posture of the Buddha. A being always and eternally in a strange kind of contemplative existence, dreaming forth worlds, for conjuring up in meditation all of this vast pageantry of existence which is suspended upon the impulses of will and yoga. This infinite meditating power, Adi Buddha, the primordial, the power of the consciousness and of the mind which in the course of time will come forth from this infinite being. The infinite meditator produces from meditation that which apparently is distinct from itself, individuality. Individuality, therefore, is not at the apex. It is a conditioned expression, as Pythagoras was aware. The eternal meditator produces, therefore, from meditation beings that exist with a certain sense of individuality, beings in whom the infinite unity is obscured, but who still participate in the volitional power to become to attain certain things, and are therefore the powers that set up the world. Of these volitional beings, the highest are those which we call deities. This term being given to the first moon-born progeny of the infinite, being born of the mind of the infinite. They possess an essence which is of the nature of mind. But locked within this essence 
is also the life part of consciousness itself. But the mind born cannot explore consciousness by mental power. Therefore, as was referred to in the, the Edos and Sagas of the Scandinavian legends, the deity Odin, representing cosmic mind, was able to know all secrets except the secret of his own origin and his own destiny. These he could not know. So the great generation of the mind born actually begin the population of the firmament. And from these mind born descend all the orders of life possessing mind or possessing manners or possessing the attributes of the thinker. Now the mind born have had a, bad, a rather rocky and difficult time of it. Because actually it is the destiny of all things that are essentially the progeny of mind that they must remain unaware or ignorant of their own origin, of the substance of themselves. They can penetrate only a little distance into their own nature and then they are blocked by the instrument which they have to use for penetration. For the mind cannot transcend itself. Nor can it know that which cannot be contained within the experience of mentality. Thus the deities of ancient times established somewhere in space the beginning of worship. And even in the oldest records that we know, it was held and affirmed that the gods of high Olympus and equally high Neo still pay homage to the infinite principle at the source of themselves. And they represented this infinite principle uh, by various symbols, by regalia, by the establishment of priesthoods. The concept being uh, capable of a brief solution thus, that the mind can explore that which is available to intellect. But beyond that which is available, there can only be belief, faith, and acceptance. So the highest attribute of the mind born is faith in that which transcends itself. Thus it is the duty or responsibility, the opportunity and privilege of the mind born to affirm the existence of consciousness although the mind of itself cannot directly experience this. And after every effort to utterly define it is to define it in some way. It follows, therefore, that there has been this division set up in the very process of creation itself, dividing all things into those that can know and those that cannot know. Also, it is recognized and realized that the amount that can be known is enlarged by the process of evolution and growth. That there are ways by which the individual can extend knowledge. That it is possible for him to gradually eliminate some of the interval of not knowing for the purpose of gaining fuller insight into the responsibilities and obligations of his own existence. Man is not supposed to learn either to justify or console himself. Nor is he to learn on the presumption that by learning 
he is going to take over the mastery of, the, of creation. He is supposed to learn in order that he may gradually come into a fuller insight into the plane to which he belongs, and therefore more capable of voluntary cooperation with that plan. Thus the degree of knowledge and the degree of not knowing differs with different forms of life. And in the Eastern system it is assumed that there are many ways of knowing other than those ways known to man. And the fact that a creature is not equipped to use such methods as we possess in no way implies that that creature cannot know. It simply means that it has other bridges between itself and necessary knowledge. In man's affairs, we have observed that there are really two forms of knowledge other than those which are traditional or are developed and passed on from one generation to another. One of these forms is instinct and the other is intuition. Instinct is a term which we apply to ways of finding out about things without mind or with a kind of mind that we regard as unequipped or unable to rationalize. Intuition is a term which we apply to processes that transcend the mind or seem to cause it to extend further into the unknown than might reasonably be expected. Intuition, of course, is the subconscious process of becoming gradually aware of the universe that extends beyond mind and in the course of time gaining certain rudimentary insight as to the probabilities of this larger region. Now the gods in Indian philosophy, which are the mind born of the meditating power, represent those forces which are peculiarly related to the manifestation of created patterns in space. Gods represent units of mind within which worlds are evolved. These mental units must enclose at least psychologically their creation. So each creation must be subservient to its own creating power. This Hinduism gives us another valuable pattern upon which to build. Namely, that the eternal consciousness in manifesting its infinite diversity of forms must do so by means of hierarchy. In other words, the various steps of creation must be assigned to units of intelligence capable of performing these specified duties. It is consequently assumed that the universe is a vast order of life ruled over by a vast hierarchy of beings. These beings arising as impermanent images within the nature of the unconditioned consciousness space itself. All of the gods, so called, are capable of birth and capable of dissolution. The only thing that cannot be dissolved is consciousness itself. Thus, none of the manifestations of consciousness can be eternal. But in terms of human experience, man knows that they can extend for vast aeons of time, to be measured in billions of years. 
and have been billions of light years as far as distances are concerned. Yet although to us such vast beings, the great stars, and those powers even beyond stars which are invisible to us, but are infinitely greater than any galaxy that we can contemplate, all of these are subject to dissolution and must, according to the great cycles to which they belong, pass through the mystery of sleeping and waking, and of life and death, like all other created things. Whereas the ancient Jewish prophet said, Oh, it is only the Lord God of Israel who neither slumbers nor sleeps. It is consciousness itself that alone passes through no process of losing its own nature or regaining it. But loss of selfhood and the regaining of selfhood can exist within it, but it cannot itself be lost, divided, or cease for one instant in its own awareness of its own being. Well, if we wish to assume this concept to be more or less the idea behind Indian philosophy of the universe, and that this process takes place within vast cycles of time running to billions of years, and that all the different levels of the cosmos have their own cycles, their own time periods, which are to us immensities beyond calculation. Then we have what might be termed the great machinery of the cosmos. We have a machinery which, according to the Eastern mind, is ensouled with life. The final proof of this ensoulment being the fact that it is alive. And that in the very process of becoming alive, it becomes subservient to the infinite laws of life and generation, so that all of this vast part progeny in space unfolds, grows, matures, fulfills its destiny in a perfectly orderly and completely purposeful manner. Now this might be a, considered a very brief summary of the psychocosmical process. But we know that out of this, later, rose the other system of thinking to which Madame Blavatsky was most addicted, and that was Mahayana Buddhism. We know definitely that Buddha himself had available to him these great universal concepts of Hinduism. Because he possessed this as a natural birthright, being of princely origin and belonging to the caste of the warriors, Gautama Buddha was naturally instructed in this ancient law. And so were most of those early companions who formed the first cycle of the patriarchs and the arhats. Just as most of the early Christians were derived from Orthodox Jewish backgrounds, so most of the early Buddhists were born of Hindu families, trained and raised in Hinduism. Consequently, they shared together this kind of an attitude toward life. It was this basic information which they did share in common that probably did the most to protect early Buddhism from some of the pitfalls that have been so detrimental to other religions that did not have an adequate grasp of universal immensities. Our modern astronomers today would probably regard the Hindu position as almost ultra-conservative. They would say that it is even bigger than India anciently thought it was. 
But even the modern astronomer, with all his discoveries, cannot outwit the moral implications of the Hindu theology. Astronomy has not been able to prove or demonstrate that consciousness does not exist. It has not found any other answer to take the place of the great concept of Eastern mysticism. Modern astronomy is satisfied to try to explain uh, the nebular hypothesis, prove it or refute it. It is satisfied to explore slowly and painfully the substances of the astronomical diffusion. But even today, after thousands of years, the astronomer cannot actually find serious fault with the Hindu thinking. In some way, long ago, intuitively at least, these Eastern peoples hit upon the one tremendous fact of immensity. They realized that the universe was not merely one little solar system. And they also realized that whatever the divine power was that ruled all things could not simply be locked up within the structure of a single planet or develop itself harmoniously in the atmosphere of a single religion. It, these things could not be. This does not prove the religion for long. It proves, however, they got themselves into trouble by making God too small, by accepting something that would be violently opposed by the progress of knowledge, and for which they had no adequate explanation. Buddhism escaped this along with Hinduism, and that is the reason why the impact of Western knowledge upon Buddhist countries has caused no religious upheaval. These countries were perfectly willing to accept it. If they had the wrong shape of the world at some other time and had it square instead of round, and wiser people knew it was round, the Buddhist made it his round without any apology to anybody. Because he had never actually claimed to know its shape. He created symbols for it. He will be always willing to take the most approved shape now. But if in the future they change that, he will change again. He will never be locked within an ancient concept which he cannot outgrow. The only concept he will accept is this infinite consciousness unfolding forever. Out of this concept, of course, gradually developed the magnificent vision that is found in the Sutra of the Lotus of the True Law. Here this great Hindu system is suddenly transposed to the Buddhist level to become a great Buddhist system. Here all the gods of Hinduism become Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, or guardian deities of the Buddhist doctrine. Now, one of the interesting points that Buddhism pointed out in the Northern School is that the gods, whether they be Brahma or Shiva or any of the deities of Hinduism, must also learn what they already do not know namely that they are thoughts in the divine mind, just as man is, and that actually what they, eat, what they term gods are not really gods at all. They are just consciousness growing up in space, and man and the gods are a single fabric with the gods as older brothers and men as younger brothers. But not should we assume deities to be special creations, separate from law, or capable of breaking law any more than the humblest atom can do so. 
for actually in the process of its development, northern Buddhism adopted most of the gods and gave them a larger education toward the further enlightenment of their own beings. And we therefore find the story, as referred to in many of the ancient carvings, of the deities Brahma and Indra, seated at the feet of Buddha, receiving instruction. Right. Not because of historical Buddha instructed them, but because like all other things, and all other beings, they had to finally sit at the feet of consciousness and learn the ineffables which are separate beings they could not completely understand. Buddhism, consequently, suddenly populated the firmament with a new kind of being called a Buddha. And never at any time were these Buddhas gods. They were always and forever simply part of the great creation growing up. They were orders of life, legitimate orders, evolving from the lowest to the highest, along with everything that existed. And here we do have a hint of the meaning of the Greek concept of heroes. When man proceeds one further step, he will obtain heroic consciousness, which is the consciousness of the Arhat. The Arhat being the sage. The Arhat being in Buddhism, the one who has accepted the doctrine and is resolved uh, to perfect his own nature. This, therefore, represents another order of life. Man, below him the animal, above him the arhat. And while as far as can be perceived, the arhat resembles man, except in oriental art, he is usually a bit eccentric in representation. He is a strange, wild being, dedicated mysteriously to truth alone. So when the individual enters the dedication to the search for understanding in order that he may completely obey, he becomes the Arhat or the one worthy of respect, for he is striving to attain cosmic usefulness. And as the Arhat is above man, so in the northern system, the next order above the Arhat is the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva is separate from the Arhat only in one essential particular, and that is the vow of service. The Arhat, having reached a certain degree of development, either chooses to retire into the Paramadana, or else to sacrifice this in order to become a servant of man. If the Arhat takes the Bodhisattva vow of renunciation, renouncing his own perfection, or his own return to consciousness, in order that he may assist all other suffering creatures to attain consciousness, that he may go in with them, but never before them. If he attains this, if he achieves this, he is then a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva may, however, be a long time in attaining to the full measure of his enlightenment. For after the taking of a vow, he must continue until he culminates that vow. And it is assumed that he can only achieve the ultimate goal which he attend, uh, intends to achieve when there is actually a Buddha alive and embodied in the world. Therefore, from the Paramahana of Gautama Buddha to the advent of the Maitreya Buddha, the uh, Bodhisattva 
cannot in any way alter their courses of action. Above and beyond the Bodhisattva is the final state recognized in Buddhism, and that is the state of the Buddha. If we go back now to the historical life of Gotham, we find that this life is divided into two distinct patterns. In one of these patterns, we find the meditating mystic, the true seeker, the one who fasted and prayed and came very close to death, who finally achieved the illumination of Buddha Gaya. He then went forth on a spiritual ministry that lasted for nearly 50 years. In this ministry, we find him teaching, meditating, praying, discoursing with his disciples, uh, seeking to share with them the Dharma and the Sword, or the Law and the Morals. This uh, very largely represents the concept of the Theravada school, or Southern Buddhism, the teacher, uh, the Aha approaching the final liberation. But in the records and in the books, even in the Dhammapada, and of course in substance, in the Mahaparamavana Sutra, we find Buddha emerging with a different personality. This is the personality of the servant. We find Buddha wandering around, helping the sick praying for the aged, listening to the complaints of contendants in court, trying to arbitrate the disputes of princes and their lands and goods, trying to help people bring up and properly educate their children, outperforming innumerable common services as, a, as an unselfish humanitarian. Walking for miles along the roads, living under the stars, forever available to those in need, That's receiving disciples and instructing them, and at the same time sharing with all the common hardships of the pilgrim. This is the Mahayana phase of the Buddha nature. So in Mahayana, we have a different concept, even of the Buddha being. He is no longer the one who simply retires into oblivion. Although it is not at all certain that Buddha himself actually taught Nirvana as annihilation of individuality. He simply refused to discuss it. But in the northern system, we find the emergence of the great metaphysical Buddhas, who in turn had arisen from the order of the Bodhisattvas. Of these metaphysical Buddhas, we have one such as Amida, or Amitabha, Lord of the Western Paradise, who having completed his vow of service, has fashioned a region to receive into itself all those with whom he served and labored, so that they would go forth with him into everlasting peace. This concept of the Mahayana Buddha, the metaphysical Buddha, is the concept set forth in the Sutra of the Lotus of the Good Law. Here space is filled with an infinitude of these radiant, uh, self-attained, self-achieved beings, who by their own merits have risen from the lowest grains of sand, and by ages of dedication have come finally to be the benevolent protectors of those growing up around them as their children, and their disciples, so that the Mahayana transforms this whole pattern into a wonderful, benevolent 
firmly relationship. Now these two patterns, space filled with the gods of Hinduism, space resplendent with the Buddhas of Northern Buddhism, a space in either case, a vast friendliness, filled with potential life, with Buddhism somewhat more democratic in its approach. For in Hinduism the heavy boundaries of the caste system still have their weight. But in the modern school of Buddhism, everyone, every being, regardless of a state, every creature, male and female, every animal, bird, insect, have within itself the potential and the equal right to eternal illumination and eternal peace. Uh, this difference, however, did not skimp the astronomy of the Buddhist theory. It simply gave a new kind of being, authority. It caused the law to operate through creatures produced by itself, rather than by creatures arbitrarily set up over it. Instead of the deities arising primarily from the mind of the infinite, the deities arose primarily from creation itself according to laws in the mind of the infinite. And the universe was transformed into a great process of growth, an infinite unfoldment of the Buddha seed, the Bija, as it was called, the seed that is everywhere and in everything, the seed that is symbolized by the beautiful pagoda and the relic contained within it. This infinite growth of things upward resulted in a series of beliefs and attitudes uh, which occur in both Hinduism and in Buddhism, but with a different basic perspective due to the variance in the theory itself. The Hindu system developed a series of teachers suspended from the supreme being, Shiva, as the Mahaguru, as the great teacher of all things. Uh, in this sense, the educational system was established as a certainty, as a fact, as a reality, and the teachers of it were instructed by their teachers and these in turn by still higher teachers, and though at the source of all things was the great teacher, Siva. Here we have a dogmatism descending, a, a concept that all truths were established in a descent of teaching and that these truths reach this planet from other worlds, and that the great uh, cluster of the esoteric order for our solar system uh, occupies the mysterious Gobina in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia, and that of the whole solar system one there in the constellation of the bear, the great bear, or the Rishi, the stars of the immortal teachers. It follows, therefore, that in Hinduism, man moves step by step along a path that had been clearly set for him by divinity and the, that the great virtue rested in the unconditioned acceptance of this, 
and a continual acceptance of the instruction of the Buddha. And that this instruction demanded the absolute loyalty of the disciple. Because the Guru was, by a kind of apostolic succession, descended from truth itself. The Guru system, therefore, was a great structure of spiritual education, which at one time, of course, also included education in practically all secular matters. The Buddhist system was essentially not too different, but there was one very curious difference, which in a way altered the whole picture, more than we have any uh, realization about until we begin the actual study of the yoga and of the tantra. This is that the great schools arose not from mysterious superhuman beings, messengers or avatars of deity, but the great schools, like man himself, evolved upward out of the darkness of ignorance and may therefore properly be represented by the open blossom of the blue lotus, which having sent its stem up through the mud and the water, finally opens its immaculate blossom upon the surface and adores the sun. Thus in Buddhism, the great schools, so-called, are really created by enlightened, illumined human beings. These schools have no significance, no meaning, and no purpose outside of humanity. The symbolism is only valid because man is the creature that he is. They are fashioned from human necessity and not by divine dictatorship. In substance, their instruction is not very different. But the disciple or student is always reminded that the final unfoldment of knowledge is a voluntary action of his own. That it is the release of truth in himself that constitutes uh, achievement. Truth is not bestowed by any power. Truth is innate and is released by aspiration, dedication, and discipline. Thus the Buddha seed is the reason why man can know. It is because he possesses within himself the archetypal form by which Buddhahood can be attained. Now the Buddha, as we found in several of the sects, uh, the Buddha is again only a word. The Buddha represents body or enlightenment in terms of human achievement. No man, no Buddha is one of the old axioms. And Zen has made a great deal of it. Actually, the Buddha is a symbol of what man, as man, can accomplish in himself, of himself, and by himself through personal dedication and collective effort. He represents, therefore, what may reasonably be expected of man. And in no sense of the word does Buddha represent any extraordinary power bestowed by any deity upon any world, nor does it represent an embodiment of a deity in any way different than the deity in in all and equally embodied in everything that lives. 
This is not a a denial of deity, but it is a denial of an extraordinary process by which some can attain, by virtue of a different code of conduct than that required of mankind in general. It then actually means that the term Buddha was applied anciently to a historical person but gradually came to represent the archetypal human being in the first development of his humanity. We have exactly the same uh, process of transformation taking place in the New Testament, where Jesus, the human teacher, is gradually identified with the Christos, the universal mystery of life. And it was Paul who transformed a Syrian sect into a world religion. It is in the same way that Mormon Buddhism transformed a sect that was practically extinct in India into one of the most powerful forces in the moral history of Asia. This transformation was achieved by one circumstance of basically, namely that Buddha represented nothing extraordinary, nothing miraculous, nothing utterly wonderful, only the natural virtue of man given an opportunity to express itself through right dedication to the great labors of human redemption. In this sense, therefore, the esoteric schools in Buddhism represent, therefore, the grades of schools established by those who have walked the path themselves. Every teacher in Buddhism has a core and fond memory of his own total ignorance. He is also enabled, much as the Buddha did in the Jataka Terrace, to describe the incidents of his own previous embodiments, many of which were not commendable, but which represented in their time and under their circumstances the breaking of human consciousness for reality. The Buddhist esoteric school, therefore, is tied to the pattern of experience rather than the pattern of revelation. It represents man working out a way for his own salvation. And uh, achieving this path through the gradual exploration of the world by such sensory and other perceptions as he may possess. These perverse, uh, perceptions dedicated to their highest and most proper use. Because of its position, of course, Buddhism also eliminates uh, many of the products which most come from a revelational system, all one based upon acceptance or rejection of divine edicts. Uh, in Buddhism, for example, there can be no true concept of hell. Uh, there are in various Buddhist systems stories about heaven and hell, and all the mysterious regions where individuals suffer punishments for their mistakes. The sixth region here is well known in Tibetan Lamaism, a form of Buddhism. But even as the Buddhist tells you the story, he smiles and reminds you that heaven and hell are merely attitudes of your own mind. But if you live in the face of a bad conscience, you are certainly going to be punished. That wherever the mind attaches itself to illusion, it must suffer. And if a person over a number of lives attaches himself to delusions, he must have a long and difficult course of rescue 
for the simple reason that he must rescue himself, and perhaps has lost all interest in so doing. The problem of how to rescue a person who does not know he is lost, without someone helping him, becomes a rather difficult problem. But the ancient law is equal to this emergency in all of us. The individual who is wrong, who is for fifty lives or a hundred lives, and is convinced of the correctness of his error, must sometimes be brought back into line by suffering. He cannot continue indefinitely and eternally to make mistakes that hurt him. And gradually, if his nature deteriorates, these mistakes become more frequent and more irrational and more obviously false and profoundly they become sufficiently simple, sufficiently obvious and sufficiently uncomfortable to force their recognition. This is the only way in which nature actually intervenes in the process of enlightenment. This is all that is necessary. For the moment man knows that certain causes of action lead to suffering, and certain other causes of action lead to serenity and peace, he is, he is already in possession of the key to his own salvation. So these two schools develop together to produce a great transphysical philosophy. Neither Brahmanism, Hinduism, or Hinduism would like to be called metaphysical, and neither, finally, would Buddhism. We may call them metaphysical or mystical movements, but they prefer to think of themselves as perfectly orderly rationalizations by scientific means of the science of human regeneration. They prefer to be regarded simply as a lawful way out of the confusion, mystery, and maze of human life. The only answers to those problems which commonly burden all of us. Madame Blavatsky, taking these two systems and several others, did something which has always been completely permissible in nature but has nearly always led to a horrible situation when it was attempted in the Western world. Namely, Madame Blavatsky followed the processes of the old buildings and our hats of ages. She brought the elements together in a new arrangement. As far as I can see, she combined these two systems uh, to create a structure which she regarded as suitable to the needs of people of the 20th and 19th centuries. She fully realized that many aspects of Oriental philosophy could not be applied after the passing of thousands of years to the conditions of modern people. Also that prejudices and opinions were such that it was very important to strip these older beliefs of any associations which might damage their acceptance. And for all, the gods are not proud. There is no particular reward in nature for orthodoxy. The only people who really appreciate it are the orthodox people themselves. For the rest, it has no valid significance. The new schools of Indian philosophy uh, arose over a long period of time. There were many splinter groups, most of them were respected. Each one was regarded as a perfectly reasonable development to meet the needs of people with special requirements. Thus, long before the advent of Buddha, there have been many systems of philosophy set up in Asia. These systems, of course, will be in vain, but we cannot fail to notice. Namely, that even in India in that time, 
there are certain immense facts we know. India is still captured in the web of its own realization. Namely, that creation as we know it is a mental entity, therefore incapable of identification with absolute truth itself, only in some conditioned way. This means searching for truth. Instead of being dogmatic and insisting that one has it and no one else can have it, in India from the early time it was assumed that truth would probably ultimately be realized as the sum of all honorable seeking. That each individual discovering some fragment of a new knowledge or a more advanced knowledge was thereby contributing to the ultimate revelation of one religion. Religions were therefore in Hinduism inescapably one, regardless of how many sects were set, set up. Sectarianism was merely a manifestation of the absolute unity of truth. The Buddhist held almost exactly the same point of view on this. He was never greatly disturbed over the rise of new schools. And in the northern system, in the Mahayana, there are many new schools. Many patriarchs wrote important commentaries upon the ancient sutras. Even actual sacred books were written long after the death of Buddha and attributed to him, or rather to the consciousness of him, operating in the lives of the patriarchs, abbots, saints, and leaders, mahats of the faith. There was no concept of the idea that the day of revelation was dated. Revelation came to the individual only, and it could come to him in early day or in late day. It made no difference. It was his own merit. And having received this revelation, he was perfectly justified in teaching it. And this was the policy in Japan, and the sects of Japanese Buddhism that exist today that either derived from Chinese uh, schools that were brought to Japan, or else were indigenous and developed within Japanese life itself as a necessary means of interpreting a foreign religion. So if Madame Blavatsky followed the ancient order, she would feel perfect freedom in rearranging certain patterns to produce that she would regard as an appropriate dispensation. In this, it is believed or traditionally held that she was assisted by certain adepts who were of other or different religions. One of them by name, obviously a Buddhist, another a Hindu, one a Eurasian, and another a European. These various leaders unfolded spiritual centers of life, whereby they were perfectly justified in reshaping and restating the Western people certain essential, usable, practical principles of Eastern esotericism. This apparently is what was accomplished. I have talked this matter over with both Orthodox Hindus and Orthodox Buddhists. Most of them are quite convinced uh, that the message which Madame Blavatsky brought was entirely legitimate. They are also convinced, however, that it is not identical either with Hinduism or Buddhism as these are exoterically practiced today. She did not claim that they were. She claimed rather to have derived her information from certain secret sources and old foundations, by the means of which she, she sought to circumscribe, or in one way or another, modify uh, the later teachings, which probably would have been uh, a little too controversial for acceptance by non-Oriental people. 
As a result of that, what she accomplished is broadly acceptable to both Hindus and Buddhists. It is also viewed with considerable admiration and respect by Parsis, uh, by Muslims, Sufis, and other various groups. Of course, this acceptance depends to a great degree upon the basic attitudes of the groups themselves. But actually, in the Sufi doctrine, there are strings of information which belong to all of these groups, and which for the most part have been neglected by them. Therefore, the general feeling that arises in connection with this uh, revelation is that it is a restoration of all times, of all things that have been forgotten, even by the orthodox members of liberal religions. Yet when brought to their attention, they remember that there were vestiges, references, and intimations that such things actually existed long ago that there were such truths that were broadly available, uh, but uh, which had been lost, so to say, in the rise of creedal and denominational religions. Thus, the Sufi doctrine seeks to break through these boundaries, and one of its essential purposes is to point out that so far as we know today, that part of Eastern wisdom, which is now incorporated in the Vedas, the Institutes of Manu, the Vishnu Purana, and the Zend Avestas, and the original basket books of Pali Buddhism, that these elements together constitute a reasonable summation of what may be termed the original basic religion of mankind. That at a remote time, even in this world in which we live, there was a common spiritual heritage. We have discovered in recent years, for example, what looks as though it is going to be a key, it is to be a key to the basic language of mankind. And we have long believed that there were a number of root languages which were separate and for which there could be found no reasonable common denominator. We are now convinced that all languages of mankind, even those of primitive people, have one origin, have a common source in a primordial language. In the same way, it is conceivable and now held that what we now know as the light of the Veda, or the light of the law, not necessarily referring now simply to Hindu law, but the light of the great law of things. And the great law was revealed to the institutes of Manu, represent the primordial religion of mankind. That this religion developed either in the valley of the Indus or perhaps in the great Trans-Asian area involving and bridging from Persia to China. That somewhere in this vast area, the first major spiritual revelation of religion came to man, or man experienced it. It is very probable that he experienced it. It was the dawn of his own discoveries of self. And this experience revealed through him and to him. Began the process of enlightening him and establishing him upon a path of spiritual growth. Now we also realize that today, and as far as that is concerned, we can go back to 2,500 years ago, and realize that the reforms of Buddha, and also the great revelations of Zoroaster, Confucius, Lao Tzu, and other teachers of the time, 
have their roots in earlier religions. Just as Judaism had its roots in Babylonian and Syrian faiths which preceded it. And Christianity was heavily embedded to the Mosaic law. Muslimism in turn was a combination of Orientalism, Christianity, and Judaism. So therefore, we have to assume that in the human experience of things, knowledge is first perpetuated by descent, that the first knowledge is always of the outer nature of things. And that only the mystics or esotericists arise within the structure of a religion does its inner meaning become apparent. And this inner meaning is nothing more or less than the Buddhist lotus rising out of the darkness and blossoming, where it is man's own light coming of age through him and using his former doctrine as a symb symbolical catalyzing agent. So it is also held that in the very beginning of things, long before we knew anything on this planet about these matters, that it is essential that a tradition of some kind must have reached this planet, either from previous cycles of life, from the higher uh, invisible planes of this planet, or from some source other than that of the evolving human being who is still trying to make the bridge between an anthropology and a human existence. So in nearly all religions, there are references to these ancient revelations. And the question as to how they came, where they came from, and what they were, will always be intriguing. One new point, of course, is that graduates from previous wife waves could well have been the source of this instruction, because it is a foolish to assume that we are the only class that ever hopes to graduate from the university of existence. Another pattern is that these revelations were placed here in anticipation by beings who were to become incarnate here. After they became incarnate, their inner faculties would have been so obscured that they could no longer have remembered. To cover this point, they bestowed their knowledge upon institutions or groups in the world, so that when they later took on bodies, their own knowledge would be available to them and would come to them as well from another person. All of these patterns can be variously interpreted, but it was held, of course, by nearly all the ancient peoples, that in some way the great descent of the esoteric wisdom was a valid unfoldment here in this environment of an eternal tradition that this eternal tradition actually was built around a contemplation and comprehension of the plan of consciousness for existence. That it descended in various ways uh, through those of different degrees of insight. The ancients never claimed that even the highest of the esoteric schools was perfect but it did represent that which man had been able to know, to learn, and to understand concerning the infinite plan for things. This school, or these schools, which, is, which were groups now generally referred to as the Sangha in Buddhism, the Brotherhood, was composed of all who had attained transcendent enlightenment, all who possessed greater knowledge, Form the faculty for the initiation of those possessing lesser knowledge. Such was the way in which the mystery schools of Greece and Egypt and other ancient nations came into existence. The initiators had themselves received the enlightenment, but most of all, 
will receive the disciplines by means of which they could unfold their own inner powers to the degree that they could comprehend their personal experience, certain expansions of mental and spiritual insight. It is therefore assumed, either by the Buddhists or by the Hindus, that the only valid source of knowledge had to be the awakened faculties and powers of the individual. These powers and these faculties would lead him to what the ancients called the lesser mysteries. They would lead him up to the point where the mind fulfilled its own destiny. They were taken as near to truth as man could bring it, and were given, therefore, a complete rationalization of the purposes of existence as man himself can know them or can learn them, either by theory or practice. So that finally the individual comes to the circumference of the universe of mind. And here he stands so to say, or sits, as according to the Buddhist philosophy, on what is called the threshold of vacuity. He goes as far as he can go. One step further, and he can never again capture even his own mentality. One step further, and he must go into a superior state of existence which he cannot estimate, and which from this side of the veil appears to be nothing. It appears to be a vacuum, an absolute blank. That is the reason why it was called vacuity in the old writings. But we are now in a position to be very doubtful about the whole problem of vacuity. So we have suddenly discovered what we always affirm, namely that nature abhors a vacuum. We have no reason to believe that vacuum exists. We can produce certain types of artificial vacuum in a laboratory, but we're not even sure that that is a true vacuum. What we really are beginning to suspect is that what we know as the unknown is actually the fullness of all things worth knowing. The consciousness itself, with all its magnificent equipment lies in this thing that we call vacuum. In any event, mind having achieved its highest degree of attainment is expressed in the seven school by the Arhat in Buddhism, who has brought the mind under perfect discipline and can renounce it without a moment's hesitation, perfectly willing uh, to exchange mind the vacuum, if such is the fact, but deeply convinced that there is something beyond vacuum. In the northern system, we have the Bodhisattva, who having reached the boundaries of this mysterious realm, must either return and serve, and must continue on uh, to the final state of existence, which is described by the old a uh, Buddhist poem that has the line in it, down, down, down to the other shore. The end of this condition that we know, that that which steps through never returns, and this stepping through is an infinitely more uh, momentous thing in the very simple and comparatively an important process of stepping through the gate of death into that which lies beyond. But this uh, Bodhisattva state is as far as the individual can go and retain self-awareness and be aware of existence as an intellectual entity in relation to other entities. Whatever lies beyond must be, if you the northern uh, Buddhist, Nirvana, to the southern Buddhist, some mysterious abode of infinite peace and to the Hindu, the attainment of identity with Atman through the process of the final samadhi. 
these different processes all represent the step from the lesser mysteries to the greater. The step from conditioned knowledge, still largely infiltrated with ignorance, to infinite unconditioned knowledge, uh, which is actual participation in the consciousness of eternity itself. The world's elaborate machinery, so called, is actually very simple in substance. For each individual, where he is, can make this step. He must make it himself. He can receive some help, some guidance, some instruction. But it is only through the discipline of his own consciousness, the regeneration of his own nature, the purification of his own thoughts and emotions, that this transition can actually be made, and no one can make it for him. Nor can they practice virtues for him. He must achieve his own. Out of this concept, then, was developed a philosophy of Eastern thinking which brings together the vast background of belief, tradition, universal attitude, everything necessary to strongly defend and support this primitive, eternal path of salvation. Madame Blavatsky brought this material together in the secret doctrine in the hope that the weight of this evidence, the mass of it, and the integrity of its basic concept would assure its reasonable recognition by truth seekers in all parts of the world. And while the work has never as yet received the full recognition to which it is entitled, and probably the greatest compilation of such material that has ever been made. It is still only fair to say that with the passing of time, interest has increased rather than decreased. And more and more, the advancements of our common knowledge are revealing to us the accuracy of the esoteric tradition. And sometimes, based upon this continuing experience, we may open our eyes sufficiently to have some concept, some understanding, some insight of the magnificent universe in which we live and the wonderful destiny for which we were created. When we begin to think in this way, most of the common problems of our daily living will automatically solve themselves. Well, time is up, so that's all we can do for this evening. <laughs>